Hi, I'm Bob Moon, pastor here at First Methodist Church in Valdosta, and we're so glad that you've joined us. We're in the midst of a series called The Seven Longings of the Human Heart. Today we're talking about the longing for intimacy. Why, every person wants to know that there's someone that they can be close to. They want to know that they're accepted. They want to know that they're loved. Well, we're going to talk about that because we are in the midst of a world that has an epidemic of loneliness. Somebody said that the word intimacy could be said to mean into me see. <laughs> it's seeing who I really am. And then, do you really love me? Well, today, we are going to take our conversation and we are going to go to the cross of Jesus. There we will find that God draws us into the deepest and most powerful intimacy of all and then frees us into loving intimacy with the people who are around us. So join with us today. We're so glad that God brought you here. Well, I had a, a seminary professor by the name of Donald Joy who went on a local TV talk show in a sort of a debate about sex education in the schools. And he began his remarks with these words. I don't believe we have sex education in the school. And the other guy was so caught off guard. He said, yes, we, you know, in the books and... 
And here's what Dr. Joy followed up with. He said, oh yeah, I mean, we teach about body parts and reproduction and diseases and this sort of thing, but nobody teaches about how to have a good relationship, how you build intimacy. Well, he had an excellent point there. We find ourselves in a world where we are so confused about this. When you heard the term intimacy, I wonder for how many of us sex came to mind. Take a look at the picture on the front of your uh, bulletin. Always interesting. I, I'm always grateful for an abundance of leaves. And uh, I've never seen a, a picture where Eve didn't have long hair. Uh, you know, just a, a quick word here on the subject of sex, because sometimes we in the church just do a terrible job about this subject. First of all, let me just say, sex is a good gift. The devil didn't create sex. God did. I had a friend of mine who once said, his grandmother said to him, David, sex is bad. You're meant to save it for the one you love. <laughs> you know, what does that, that doesn't make any sense. The point is, sex is good. That's why you save it for the one you love. You know, you can have intimacy without sex. And listen to me, you can have sex without intimacy. And our poor world is so lost in space on that part that people are missing out on intimacy. So I brought two show and tells with me. First of all, I brought these two plates. Now, this is one of our nicer plates. I really wanted to bring our fine china, but I really want to live to see another day. And just in case something happened, and my precious Betty would want to have, uh, I think she'd rather have this one go. But imagine for the moment, this is the valuable stuff. This is um, some plastic... I mean, you know, you, could, you can go out and dig in the ground with this stuff. No big deal. You don't go out and dig in the ground with this. Why? It's because it's more valuable. The sad thing about the way that the world deals with our sexuality, which is a valuable gift, is that we treat it as though it has very little value. So, here's my second show and tell. You all recognize what this, what's this thing? Sticky note, okay? Now, a sticky note, you can put onto something and it'll stick. But what happens if you say, well, uh, no, I don't want... After a little while, what's going to happen? It's not going to stick anymore. And the reason is it's lost all of its stickiness. There is the second great tragedy of our times. People think that they can have this kind of relationship with people. And the great tragedy is, in the end, they have lost their capacity to form sticky relationships. They've lost the capacity to form real intimacy. So, when we talk about intimacy, let's, let's go back to the beginning, all right? God creates the world. And you remember Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and He says at the end of each day, go back to your Sunday school classes now, He says it is good. And so, six times you have, it is good, it's good. Last day, it's very good. Do you know where in the Bible is the first time that it says it is not good? Well, it's in the next chapter. God created Adam. Adam's all by him, his lonesome. God looks at it and says, that's not good. You know, this guy is pathetic. He needs somebody to help him out. And so he creates Eve, 
And uh, so Adam names her woman. Somebody said when he saw her, he said, whoa, man. So I don't know if that's the truth or not. But God, uh, we are made for relationship. Now, here's the thing I want to say. We are made for intimacy. We are made to be close to one another. We are not made to live in isolation. You know, one of the really great sadnesses of our time is that we live in a time of incredible loneliness. I think it can best be described by a woman who uh, said one day, she said, I realized I had 500 friends on Facebook, but no one I could call to come and help me if my child got sick. I mean, how lonely we are. Do you all remember what it was like when you went, and we've probably, every one of us has had some kind of experience like this, where you went off to some place where you didn't know anybody? I don't know what it was like for you. You went off to college, and you were alone, or maybe it was just a conference or some place, and you found yourself all alone. I remember going to college. I moved from India to Kentucky, and the only person I knew there was my brother. And I remember how alone, I, I hated going in to the cafeteria, because everybody else was talking with other friends, and I felt all alone. I mean, loneliness is hard. I just wanted my group of, of friends where I belonged, and they belonged to me, and, you know, we had closeness. And we understand that, don't we? And yet, in our time, there's so much loneliness. Oh, we all say, we're just fine. But deep inside, there's this loneliness for real intimacy, for relationships that are deep, for relationships that really matter. You know, it says about Adam and Eve that they were naked and unashamed. But as soon as they sinned against God, what did they do? They got some leaves and put them together and they began to hide. Why? Because they said to themselves, oh, we know we've done wrong. Shame entered in, and they said, if we can just hide the reality from God, then maybe we'll be okay. Well, since that time, every one of us, we've hidden not just from God, we've hidden from one another. We put on our nice exterior so we all, you know, look good, and everybody will like us because I just look just like I'm great. I mean, I don't know what you all think when you look up here. You know, you see somebody good-looking, hunky, generally awesome. Uh, yeah, but, you know, we try and, we, all of us do. We try and show our best self. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But i tell you what, where the problem is, is when we think, yeah, but if they really knew me, if they knew the stuff that I'm the only one who knows, then they would reject me, and they wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. And so, what we do is we draw apart, we draw away from people, and we choose to live in isolation. But that's not the way that God's designed it, and that's not the way in the end it's going to be. In 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, it says this, now we see through a glass darkly. So, think a foggy window. You know, you can kind of see a little something through there, but you can't see very clearly. It says, but then, when, when we're fully restored in Christ, then we will fully know as we are fully known, we will have perfect intimacy and relationship, and we won't be ashamed. We won't need to hide ourselves anymore. We are made for relationships. I mean, consider in John chapter 8, that powerful story about how Jesus... Uh, has, they bring this woman before Jesus who's been caught in adultery. Now, let's just take a, an, a brief aside here. I don't know what was going on in this woman's life, but it's pretty clear in this story that she's being used. And who knows? Has she found her sexual attraction to be a way to try to get intimacy from men? Well, I don't know. But in the end, all that happened was she ended up being used. 
I'm telling you, it happens all across our country and our world today. But they bring her and say, you know, we ought to stone her. And Jesus said, let the one without sin cast the first stone. And there was one person there without sin who could have stoned her. Said, all right, let's dive in. I'll start the party. But it was Jesus, perfect, sinless, who chose to forgive her, who chose to say, we're going to give you a new start. And I believe that that day, for the first time in her life, this woman who had been settling for some sort of substitute for real intimacy, discovered real intimacy. Someone who looked at her, knew her as she really was, flaws and all, and loved her anyway. That's intimacy. Deborah Hebert tells this wonderful story that I suspect many of us can relate to in some relationship, uh, whether it's with your father or not, but she tells a story about being the, uh, one of the three children in the home, and she felt like she was never good enough. The other two were the ones that always did everything right, and she was the one who always did everything wrong. Now, some of you will say, I get that. I was that kid. Uh, others of you, maybe you were one of the favored ones, but you, you get the picture here. And she always felt like, I'm never good enough. Everything I do is wrong. My, my parents must, they just must not love me. Now, that's the way she felt, okay? That wasn't the way her parents felt. That's the way she felt. And so she tells this story about how her dad uh, would call her after she'd done something wrong and say, Deborah, come over to me. And he would kneel down and get down on her level, and he would say, come on over here, and she would just drag her way over there, and he'd have his arms open, and he'd say, come on, Deborah, come on over to me, and she would just be hanging her head, and she'd think, he doesn't really want to see me, I have let him down, I've disappointed him, I'm never good enough, everything I do is wrong, and he said, come on, Deborah, come on over, and she'd just drag on over there, and then when she'd get close enough, He'd put his arms around her. Now, some of you parents, you've had this same kind of experience with your children. And so, he begins to put his arms around her, and she, this little girl, is pushing against his chest. Okay, so he's trying to take her in, and he says, and she's pushing against him and says, Deborah, look me in the eyes, and she's doing this. You know, your kids have done that, haven't you? Know, that, you know, finally, he says, look me in the eyes, and she looks him in the eyes, and he says, Deborah, I love you. I love you. And the whole time he's holding her, she's pushing against him, and then he'd take his hands away, and she'd fall back on her bottom. And he'd say, get up, come here. <laughs> and then she says, one day, one day, when he did this to me for the umpteenth time, it finally got through to me. He really did love me, despite anything I'd done. He absolutely loved me. And he said, on that day, he took his hands apart, but I didn't fall down, because instead, I had my arms around him, and I was hugging him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there are many of us in the church who still think God is holding us at arm's length. He wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. I deserve some punishment. So we come here on, to church on Sunday for a spiritual spanking, and we want the preacher to tell us how bad we are so we can say, well, at least I got my spanking and go away. That's sad. We're just pushing God away, and God's saying, come to me. I love you. Imagine this. We talked before about the prodigal son. You remember the story about the, the kid who took his inheritance, went and wasted it all, and then he finally decides he's going to come home to his father, and you remember the speech he had, right? He showed up with a speech. He said, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be son, uh, but let me just be one of your servants, blah, blah, blah. 
Well, the father sees the son coming, runs out, puts his arms around him, and the son says, Father, I am no longer worthy to be son. He says, oh, just shut up. And he just says, I'm glad you're home, throws his arms around. Listen to me. Throws his arms around him while he still smells like pigs. You with me? He doesn't say, oh, time for a bath. Now you go get cleaned up, grovel a little before me, and then we'll talk. While he's still covered with the smell and filth of pigs, the father throws his arms around him and says, I love you, and I'm glad you're home. Now, here's my question to you. How would the father have felt if the boy said, well, that's really nice of you, Dad, but I'm just not worthy to move back into the house. I'm going to go out and live in the barn anyway. I mean, wouldn't that have torn the father's heart out? The father didn't want him in the barn. The father wanted him back home. But the boy had to finally realize his father absolutely loved him and would never let him go. That's intimacy. That's what God wants to build into our hearts. And the thing is, once we recognize God's love for us, we're able to give that love to others. The fact is, there are a lot of us who don't give much intimate relationship to other people. And when we get married, we say things like, for better or for worse, and what we're really thinking is, I've got a hole in my heart as big as the Grand Canyon, but I'm marrying you so you'll fill it up. Well, guess what? We can't fill that. Nobody can fill that except God. But when we believe and receive God's love, we're able to enter into loving relationships with one another in a whole new way. And God is able to come, and He is able to help us. So today, I want to take you to, let's just go to the passage from uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to take you to this this passage uh, that talks about how God invites us into His presence. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter, say boldly with me, boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By His death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Listen, we're invited into an intimate relationship with God and an intimate relationship with one another. Today, we affirm that one of the deep longings that God has put into our heart is to share in that kind of intimacy with God and with one another. So would you just join with me in prayer? And I want to ask that God would do something in all of our hearts right now. Heavenly Father, this is a hard thing. If we've just been listening to my words, it's not going to amount to a hill of beans. But it may just be that during this sermon, many of us have been listening to the voice of God's Holy Spirit. And my words have faded into the background, and somewhere we've heard your words. And it's just hard for us to believe. We're like Deborah Hebert, like that little girl pushing our Heavenly Father away, saying, oh, I, I don't deserve to be loved. And that's the whole point. That's what grace is. When we don't deserve it, we're loved anyway. That's where we find true intimacy. So today, I pray that for all of us, we will enter into a new place in a loving relationship with God, who will never, ever let us go. Would you help us today 
we receive that love and we step into a new place in intimate relationship with you and with others because of what Jesus is doing in our heart today. At the cross, we saw the most profound, the most deep action ever in history, the most intimate thing ever in history, where Jesus looked down from the cross and said, Father, forgive them. He saw us as we are and loves us as we are and loves us too much to leave us the way we are. So, thank you for what you are doing, Lord. We receive your grace this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Let's stand together and, and let's thank God for His great grace. Let's sing together just the first verse of our closing hymn. And as we sing, I am Thine, O Lord, let's believe that and receive that and sing this as a prayer back to God. join hands with each other. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not made to be alone. That's one reason we join hands together. Or in the case of grandsons and grandmothers, we hug each other. Because we remember we're not alone. We are made for relationship with one another, and that begins by being in a right relationship with God. So, brothers and sisters, Go in God's grace. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't be afraid. Be filled with hope and life. And the life that God gives to you is the life that you can share with those around you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it good to know that we are loved? I take you back to the story of the prodigal son who after he'd ruined his whole life came back home and said, Dad, let me just live in the barn. The dad said, no, I want you to live in the house. I want you to live in an intimate relationship with me. Think how the father's heart would have been broken if the boy said, no, I'm just going to go live in the barn. Jesus doesn't want you to live in the barn. He wants you back in his home. He wants you back in his heart. So won't you just open up your arms? God's arms are already open up to you. Jesus is saying, Whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. God bless you.